Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're in group A5. My name is David. This is Mahar. That's Pranav, Patrick, and Amar. And uh, our, term, our project is going to focus on the production of vinyl chloride monomer from ethyl dichloride. So we're going to be talking about the process safety involved in this manufacturing process. So as a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, the first thing we're going to introduce to you guys is basically the implementation of basic process control systems. So this includes things such as uh, pressure, temperature, flow, and level sensors that we should implement in the process. Uh, the second thing will be a hazard analysis to identify possible threats. So this goes with uh, various process conditions associated in the equipment. And then lastly, we'll be talking about corrective action, so things to prevent possible hazards. And we're going to have a group activity to reinforce what we've come up with. All right, now just for a general process overview, um, we are doing a typical vinyl chloride monomer production plant, okay, and of which there's usually five main areas, um, direct chlorination, oxychlorination, purification of EEC, and then uh, thermal cracking, and then the purification of the VCF, the monomer. And our focus will be on the EEC purification and the VCF purification. Here's the uh, basic process control system for the EEC purification process. And as you can see on the left hand side, we have pure EDC entering, and then the heated up and flash, of which the vapor is sent into a pyrolysis reactor, and the liquid stream is purged. Um, after coming out of the pyrolysis reactor, the stream is then mixed with other recycled streams, and then flashed again, and heated up and flashed, and then sent to the VCM purification process, which is on the next slide. Okay, and then again, it's heated and flashed and sent into this time two separate distillation columns. The first of which is an HCL distillation column, and the second is the BCF distillation column. Okay, so as with most uh, industrial processes, control is a very important part of safety and operability. So the PFD shown before did not have the control system to install, and we went ahead and implemented a full control system on the plant. Our control system measures and controls variables such as temperature, pressure, level, and flow. Okay. So here's the PNID after our modifications. Some of the highlights that uh, I show you here, like the red box over there, shows a pressure control that uh, regulates the pressure inside the flash tank, the first flash tank, by adjusting the uh, vapor flow out. We're going to be doing a further hazard on that node over there in the upcoming slides. We also have a flow controller, the yellow box over here, which regulates the natural gas inflow into the furnace by adjusting the valve opening. Okay. The blue box here shows a level controller, which adjusts the uh, level inside the flash tank by manipulating a valve for the liquid stream out. And the green box is a temperature controller, a controller implemented around a heat exchanger, and it controls the steam going to the heat exchanger to adjust the temperature of the uh, uh, material coming out of the heat exchanger. All right, and now moving on to the HAZOP, we looked at two keywords, low and high, and then we also took a look at <coughs> pressure, temperature, and flow on the next slide. Um, so I'll be talking about the, the low keyword. Um, our note here is right, is right here above this last, this last drum. Um, so a couple of causes of low pressure are insufficient heating. Um, to mitigate that, we thought about putting a secondary heating element, like a jacket, around the flash drum. Um, if you have a uh, pipe leak causing low pressure, what you can do is you can take a delta T between the pressure sensor inside the flash tank and the pressure sensor on the controller, and if there's a, a delta T big enough, you can say, okay, maybe I have a pipe leak. Um, if this controller were to fail open, uh, you'd also get low pressure. Um, what we could do there is uh, put in a flow monitor, um, if you are in a high level alarm to uh, let the controllers know. Um, if you have low temperature, what the causes would be that um, your heating stream over here, uh, the steam gas fails, so you're not getting enough heat. Um, another thing we already talked about is putting that jacketed uh, flash on. Um, ambient air temperature, so if you're coming, if this is outside process and the air temperature changes, what you can do is just inflate all the piping, especially around this node that we're looking at. Um, and close the next slide. Um, if you have low flow, we're looking at a decrease in vapor pressure inside your flash drum. What you can do is you can uh, put a, a drawdown um, draw up here to store your product in case you're, you're already getting variation in your flow. Um, pipe leak already talked about that built heat. And then if this valve were to fail closed, you'd also get um, low flow. So what we thought about doing is putting everything in redundant flow uh, right here to bypass that valve if it does become closed. And then I'll pass it on for the high keyword. So looking at the high keyword for our hazard analysis, again, we uh, analyzed the same three parameters, pressure, temperature, and flow. 
Uh, so the first one we'll go over is pressure. There's a couple things that cause high pressure at our node right here, and the first one is if the pressure control valve fails closed. And what we do is to set up a bypass valve that opens uh, in case the PC value is too high, and that would help uh, with the flexibility component of the uh, operability. Uh, if we have a, the bottom of the flash drum valve uh, closing and uh, temperature rise in the flash drum, we implemented a pressure relief valve on top of the drum and that would help relate to the relief part of one of the four levels of safety. Uh, looking at the temperature parameter, uh, if we had high temperature, uh, one of the causes could be that the temperature controller failing at the inlet to the flash drum right here. Uh, so what we did is to implement a, an SIS system to cut the steam feed, which is controlled by this valve right here. Uh, and uh, like Patrick mentioned, if there are any ambient air temperature changes, we can always uh, insulate the pipes to help uh, mitigate any of that damage. Next slide. Uh, looking at the uh, flow parameter, uh, if we have high flow at our node right here, which could be caused due to uh, vapor pressure inside the tank increasing, uh, what we did is to implement a flow control valve. Uh, looking at the second cause, uh, if the level transmitter fails, causing the drum to fill with liquid, uh, we set up a redundant level transmitter independent from the process control uh, down here to help alleviate um, any high flow that would be caused. Uh, from this point, we want to go into our uh, little activity for you guys. So we handed out some papers at the beginning of the class. So if we give you a paper, what we want you to do is come up. We've drawn the flow diagram for our process. If everybody is paying attention, this shouldn't be too difficult in the past to match up your sensor or to the device, whatever you have, to where you think it goes on the flow diagram. So if you guys have a paper, please come up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll give So basically we want to overall conclude that in general you don't need 
like to overcompensate you with your safety. As long as you have the minimum requirement, well, not so much minimum requirements, but enough to make sure that your process is safe, you should also be considering the economics of the process. So you don't want to put redundant valves and sensors where you don't exactly need them. So for instance, we could be removing a heating element and just putting temperature sensors to ensure that we have the right, what we need for the process. Thank you.
cost of their brewing plant of this size would be about $31 million just for the brewing process without uh, bottling or any of the beginning processes. Um, if you were only to have one fermentation tank and one aging tank, you would lower your cost by $28 million. But you'd also lose a lot of production time as you'd have to wait for the fermentation process to be done as well as the aging to be done. So in the long run, you're probably losing money at that point. And yeah, it's important to keep the process running with this many tanks to keep it a continuous process instead of just a batch wise process in order to maximize your profit and optimization. All right, so I'm talking about uh, beer pricing and operating costs of steam whistles. <coughs> to start off, so the standard sizing they have is the 341 milliliter bottles in case, and like here goes all the prices down. And all these prices include taxes as well. So probably, you know, okay, party if you want. Uh, so then after that, there's a taxation on it. So the minimum cost for a tw uh, 24 bottle case in Ontario is 29.35, and that has increased in the past year by 55 cents, so it was cheaper last year, it's gone up. Um, so the current tax rate for beer made in microbrewers in Ontario, if, so for the kegging, so draft beer, it's 20, well 20 cents, 30, but you can convert that to dollars, and then non-draft. So an example I've done here is for one bottle, bring it through, and it's seven cents per bottle that's on it, and that's because it changed on March 1st. And then, so the cost of raw materials per brew. So these are all estimated costs because uh, Steam Whistle was not kind enough to trade, uh, give us a little secrets of how to brew. So these are all just the uh, costs that we come up with. And so for each one, it goes through and does tell you about the malt barley, the hops, the spring water, how much yeast. The big one is the operators. They actually have 12 operators working. So that's a we estimated cost of 7,000 for the year. Comes up to that, and then we put the steam as well because we use steam. And Tim will talk about that later. All right. So um, one of the things that Steam Whistle is very proud about is their uh, energy <coughs> management in the, in the plant. So um, one of the things is their feed water for the brewing process comes in here, and they actually use that to cool the um, the wort coming out of the brewing kettle. And in in doing so, that heats the feed water, and then they store it in this tank over here. The um, the, the hot water tank. Um, now that feed water has to be coming in at six and a half degrees Celsius, um, which isn't always possible. So to, you know, say in the summer when it comes in a little hotter, they can use these um, these uh, cool streams for these tanks on their way back to the chiller to bring that back down to six and a half degrees. Because um, this one's at less than negative 0.5, or this comes into the aging tank at less than negative 0.5. And this one comes in at less than 9 degrees. So you, you can see that if the feed water comes in too hot, they can cool it easily and then it gets heated and they, um, <coughs> and they can use that in the cooling process. Um, the other thing is the, um, I don't know, I too well, but uh, the, the steam heating. Um, you use the steam in the mash tun and in the brewing kettle. And uh, the mash tun runs it. process and bottling it out as a continuous process. So overall, it's, it seems a continuous process, but internally it's a bad process. From about when they serve the, the mash on to about the start of the fermentation, it takes about eight hours. They start a new batch every four hours. The kettling time in the kettle boiler is about one and a half hours. And the fermentation period is, due, is typically seven days. The aging period is typically 21 days, but it can go up to 25 days as well. The kettle is cleaned every single day, and the other two times are cleaned once a week. So normally the operators have three batches from Monday to Thursday and two batches on Friday, but the maximum production rate is five batches a day. Um, and this is because of basically process flexibility. So 
if they have a little bit of downtime, they can use up their stock inside the tanks, and then once they're up and running again, they can start the process and do more than usual to put up the stock in the tanks again. This will be shown in the past interaction part of it. So, um, two small case studies for the class. And this is to show the capability of the system. The first one is you have, an, you have 800 hectoliters. A hectoliter is 100 liters. In 800 hectoliters, you have about 60 hectoliters a day. And your process goes down because, say, a heating, uh, heat exchanger went down for some reason. How long can your process stay down for before you get a, um, how long can you have until you run out of stock and you need the process up and running again? so that it, overall your average is seeing production rate. So how much, how many excess batches from now until the renovation start period do you need to do?
they wouldn't tell us uh, how many of each they have or, or that. The one they quote on their website is 450, and that's, I mean, for the production rate, it, it makes sense. And what's the source? Um, Calgon <coughs> Springs. Yeah, Calgon yeah, Springs. Yeah, it's the Canadian Springs bottled water. Okay, so, and that is typically at six and a half degrees, or is it just? Um, the, in, you know, in, in cooler months, <coughs> yes, in yeah. warmer months, it'll go up a bit, because, you know, the pipeline, pipeline runs on the ground, right. and the average yearly underground temperature is 10, so. so that's, yeah. Thanks. 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 Um, I know they operate at the roundhouse, like, what kind of, Land or like maintenance costs are coming with that um, with operating at the Raptors. Yeah. Um, they didn't mention any ongoing maintenance costs. What what happened with the Roundhouse was it was a protected heritage site. Um, they wanted to some somebody else wanted to build a parking garage, so they actually took down the building, built the parking garage, and then put it all back up with the original materials, and that was done by the city. Um, so when Steam Whistle came in, they actually only owned half. Less than yeah. that, yeah. a third, a third of the roundhouse. Now, so when steam whistle came in, they actually redid the roof, but they had to they had to redo it using the original um, materials and construction style. So that cost a lot. But that was you know one time thing. Now the roof is going to last another you know, however long the roundhouse is. <laughs> below uh, 10.2, as Nina said, hydrogen cyanide gas will start to be released. 
uh, hydrogen cyanide gas is very poisonous. In fact, it was used in, in extermination camps during World War II by the Nazis. So our critical safety concern is we must control uh, pH, but not also that, but we must also use the proper pH sensor due to the fact that uh, finely ground ore can abrade that glass electrode, as well as lime can uh, foul the sensor, which can cause uh, faulty readings, as well as the high concentration of cyanide ions can penetrate the sensor and cause error um, so we must monitor the cyanide during and after the gold recovery process. When disposing of the cyanide, we uh, react it with uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, to form a uh, cyanate, which is a thousand times less toxic than uh, cyanide. Okay, so I'll be giving an overview where we focused our attention and some ideas we came up with. Let's start with the final thinner. The final thickener is where the slurry, which uh, has been processed upstream, is held. The thicker is very huge, if you can imagine a circle with this diameter, an operator will look like a dot on the side, from the top here. So, uh, the slurry is pumped using parallel pumps, uh, which is very convenient if we need to bypass one for maintenance, or what's up? So that is due to the pre-neutralization tank, where uh, since the slurry is acidic due to the upstream processing, Lime gets added to neutralize it and bring it up to the pH operating level we need for the agent, which is between 11 and 12. No water is added in order to bring the viscosity uh, and density of the slurry to the operating level required for the agent. Uh, we decided to over design this tank because we want to accommodate uh, more viscous um, slurry. If you do. That the main hazard part happens here in the cyanidation tank where sodium cyanide gets added. We plan to add a bun that's 25% larger than the uh, capacity of this tank in order to contain any spillage. Um, also, we have redundancy with pH control. This is very helpful since pH is the main major variable we're controlling. Also, we plan to add um, a hydrogen cyanide sensor on the cyanide tank. Uh, so um, that's something not shown here, but it will be eventually added. Also, uh, low pressure air is pumped into the neutralization tank, cyanidation tank, and the first carbon leach tank uh, to basically drive out the reaction. So as you can see, we made um, bypasses such that we don't have to uh, worry about giving air to each one. We can just uh, change the bottom whole thing. After that, we have <coughs> counter current separation. So this uh, takes place with uh, CSTRs basically, where the, um, the best part about this is that desorption and uh, absorption of the gold to the carbon happens in every single state, so that gives higher recovery. And uh, then the dentistry here comes to a screen that replaces any carbon before it gets lost, and then we have a buffer tank to regulate the flow before it gets sent to the detoxification part. Here we have bypass the first sign addition tank in case we in case we need to. Uh, the other part is the carbon will go to the stripping and regeneration where the gold is taken from the uh, carbon and carbon is recycled back. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about carbon evolution, which is the last stage that Howard just mentioned. Um, it's also referred to as carbon stripping. So in this process, what we're trying to do is to um, uh, get the gold off from the carbon and back into the solution. So in order to do that, we simply have to reverse the leaching process. So as we already told you guys, we were operating at ambient temperature and pressure for the leaching. Um, so now we need to go up to high temperature and high pressure. Um, usually the temperature is between 100 and 120 degrees Celsius for um, maximum efficiency, and uh, the pressure is between 30 to 40 degrees this process is actually pretty simple because as soon as you raise the temperature of the whole mixture, the gold will readily desorb into the solution. So, um, taking a look at this PID over here, from the top you have your loaded carbon coming in from the leaching circuit, and uh, it's pumped using two parallel pumps, and it goes to this screen right here. And the screen is used to um, uh, filter the large carbon, which continues the rest of the solution cycle while the rest is learning this pumps back up to the CIL circuit. And then um, the carbon goes into this acid wash tank. 
which is actually a very important step because what we're doing here is we're trying to treat carbon fouling. Carbon fouling is essentially the buildup of soluble and insoluble materials on the carbon active site. And it's important that we dissolve these phthalates because we don't want the gold to be competing for these active sites with um, other, other materials. So in order to do that, we have to pump hydrochloric acid in water and it's essentially go through a washing cycle. Um, it's typically 20 to 40 minutes long. And then from here, um, we pump it to a pre-soak tank and a pre-soak solution tank. And this cycle right here happens next. In this tank, we're adding um, sodium cyanide, sodium hydroxide, and water. We need to add the sodium cyanide because we need to solubilize the gold. And then we need to add the sodium hydroxide in order to keep the pH level high because, again, like we mentioned in bleaching, we don't want to um, produce HCN gas. So then um, the whatever comes out of here is pumped to a heat exchanger, and this is the most important part of the process because we want to maintain a high temperature. So we've got temperature controllers um, manipulating the steam flow into the heat exchanger. And then um, once we are at the right temperature, then we're going to go into the actual elution column, which is where the um, adsorption happens. So in this column, you've got the gold coming off from the carpet and going back into solution. Um, and then the way we do it is we're pumping um, pressurized water, which is demineralized as well, because again, you don't want to introduce those um, uh, insoluble materials that bind to the carbon active site. And then we've got a holding tank, and then from there we pump it to a heat exchanger. Again, we've got temperature controllers, because it's really important to maintain that temperature. <coughs> we're heating up the water, and then it goes into the column. Now, keeping in mind what temperature and pressure we're operating at, what's a really important safety feature that we're missing on this column right here? So we're at around 115C and 230 kPa. <coughs> really high pressure. Now the main things we focused on was the leaching, the absorption, and the elution, which was the uh, leaching would be this one, the elution is down here, and <coughs> the absorption is this. Now uh, one thing I want to point out here is the process control, which is this tiny sliver here. Now even though uh, control is important for, we need to control the, uh, the, the pH, overall, since we're at uh, ambient, ambient temperature and pressure, it's not a big uh, factor in the overall capital costs. So uh, for our class activity, we guys have to do a troubleshooting ex exercise. If you didn't uh, get the sheet, <coughs> what is going on? So what we have, is the pH in the cyanidation tank is quickly is dropping. So uh, and once it is dropped, 10.2 hydrogen cyanide gas starts to form, and we also lose uh, valuable gold. So and yet, therefore we have a 15 minute window before the SIS system kicks in and shuts down the plant. Now we don't want that to happen. We want to continue production so we don't lose gold. And so. Uh, if you guys have any ideas of what might be the problem. So the line which controls the pH is getting pumped from here into here and into the sign ID.
pHs here in the finite region. Kind of. But the modulus is probably Even though the valve here, we know that the valve here is the region. Yeah. Because the operator ran, so yes. Yeah. Okay, so yes, that can be impossible. Uh, somebody said it's an incorrect pH sensor, or the pH sensor has some error. Um, yes, they're both showing the correct reading. Okay, so our line tank is empty. It's not. <laughs> because this line tank is actually like manual, like manually maintained, so the operators have a schedule to add in line, and we're assuming that and there's a level of Slowly settle and they build it up like a little pyramid. Mm -hmm. 
and to allow the UV to uh, degrade the cyanide. I mean, I had one like a kilometer away from my house, so we go around and play around on it. It was <laughs> 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 say nothing, but it was actually pretty shocking as I think back. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and, but also, uh, but, uh, they're right. Very few people have killed themselves in the plant. Most people have killed themselves on those tables. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Um, okay, so just one quick thing. Uh, the <laughs> um, there is one final piece of work that's due for this course other than your SDL project on the 3rd of December, but that's a, um, the peer review and course reflection and course feedback. So I've lumped all of those onto one electronic form that you just fill out on the course website. It should take you about an hour uh, of time to do the whole piece of work. There's three components to it. There's the course reflection, which is an important part of self-directed learning. At the end of any SDL type activity, the way your the human mind works most effectively is to reflect back on what you've learned. So see the course reflection as a preparation for the final exam. So it comes on the same time that your project is due, so you can complete it any time between now and then. So that's the first component. The second component of that e-form is the peer evaluation, which we've discussed in the, in the memo. And then the third part is a uh, part where I'm asking for any feedback on how to improve the course for next year's class. So you can either provide it in the university's official course evaluation or you can provide it in that e-form for me. Uh, just being the first time that I teach it, I'd like to hear back from you what's worked and what hasn't worked for you and uh, to make improvements for 2013. Okay, so that's uh, a totally electronic on the website and it's already available for you to start. And due on the 3rd of December. <laughs>